So this morning we are looking at the fact that worship enjoys God. And I'm letting us do this survey because there are people who may have drawn near to God but not close enough. I say not close enough because they may have tasted of him, but they may not have drunk deep of God. There's an old saying that drink deep or taste not. Have you heard that before? Drink deep or taste not. And I worry about those of us who have had just a little experience of God, just a little dose of God, and have become immunized. You know how immunization works, right? You give a little dose of the germ and the person builds antibodies against that germ. So the person doesn't get a full-blown disease. And some of us, it seems, we were taught a bit about God when we were young. Every Sunday we come to church a bit, you know, and all of that. And we have just a bit of God. We've experienced just a bit of God. And now it's almost as if we are immunized. Anything about God, oh, I know that. I've done that. Yet we are not seeing this deep expression of an in loveness with God, head over heels in love with God. And I'm saying it's a dangerous thing to have only a little taste of God and not drink deep of Him. You know the word enthusiasm. We are talking about the fact that worship enjoys God. The word enthusiasm comes from two Greek words, en and theos. Enthusiasm literally means in God or God in you. And I'm afraid to say that in this city, maybe the God of hockey makes people more enthusiastic about hockey than the God of the Christians. Because when I look at the God of the Christians, the Christians, a lot of Christians I meet seem very gloomy and not happy. But the people who celebrate at the Bell Center are really excited. They're much more enthusiastic. Listen, you cannot tell me you are in God and God is in you and you are not enthusiastic about life. Jesus said, if you remain in me, you will bear fruit, much fruit, love, joy, peace. Don't forget, joy is one of the fruit. And I want us to pray shortly and read the scriptures for today and get into the sermon. But when I was a younger Christian, I remember many times of having such a good time during the time of worship. Having such an enjoyable time in the presence of the Lord. In your presence, I am content in your presence and we, you know you wish the worship time will never end and you're just enjoying God and you're just crying and you're just experiencing the power of his Holy Spirit and all of that and an older Christian rebuked us he said no, no 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 what do you mean by you're enjoying you're not supposed to enjoy worship Ooh. and the person had good reason for that he said because the time of worship is not for you it's for God, which is true. Worship is not for us, it's for God. But this person is this religious zeal was, was rebuking us. And so every time I had a good time in the presence of the Lord, I just checked myself and said, oh, oh I'm not supposed to be enjoying this. I'm not supposed to be saying, oh, this, the worship was so good today. I wasn't supposed to say I really enjoyed the worship time today. Yes, it's true. Worship is not for us. Worship is for God. He's the reason we worship. He's the end for our worship. He's the subject of our worship. He's the object of our worship. But you know what? There's an old Danish saying that the hand that, hands, the hand that gives roses does not fail to be left with the smell of the roses. The hand that gives roses does not fail to be left with the smell of the of the roses in other words worship is about bringing God pleasure but as we bring God pleasure it thrills our own hearts as we worship God we get to enjoy of him as, as well so my aim this morning is actually to offer us a biblical understanding not what that old Christian did and quenched the spirit of many of us but a biblical understanding of the reality that true worship provides a place of entry into the delights and the pleasures of God when we worship we literally create heaven on earth and delight in the pleasures of God and my prayer is that a deep longing will be created in us a deep desire to draw closer and closer to the true beauty and awesomeness of God in his presence that we, it will give us pure pleasure my prayer is that Sunday mornings and every other moment of worship in our everyday life between Sundays will leave you with such a joy and an enjoyment of God 
God is meant to be enjoyed, people. God is meant to enjoy it. And it's interesting, James, that you chose Psalm 67, where the psalmist said, let the peoples praise you. And the psalmist said, Lord, let the people come to know you because they've seen how much of enjoyment we have in you. Many of us, our friends will not even follow us to church because we are the saddest, gloomiest people they know. Why should they follow you? Why should they come and enjoy this pain? Of waking up in minus 30 degrees weather and going with a gloomy face into the house of God and coming back with a gloomier face. People worship and enjoy God. And I want us to delve into why. Shall we pray? Father, this is an all important subject. And we want to have your biblical understanding of why worship brings you pleasure. But in the midst of it, we also get to enjoy you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. I bind every force of hell in this place and cast it out of this place. We bind every lie of the devil in the name of Jesus. That, Lord, our minds will be saturated with your word and your word only. I bring every mind subject to the obedience of the Lordship of Christ. That we will live here. Knowing that it is okay, it is awesome, it is great to enjoy you. Because that is our purpose, to enjoy you forever. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn our Bibles to Psalm 65. Psalm 65. If you don't have the church Bible, it's printed in the bulletin as well. Psalm 65, we'll read verses 1 to 4. Are you there? Let's read it together. Psalm 65, verse 1 to 4. Let's go. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion. And to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Verse 4. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be, we shall be, we shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. Psalm 65 verse 1 to 4. Let's read Psalm 16 verse 11. It says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of what? In your presence, there's fullness of what? In your presence, there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let's end with John chapter 15, verses 9 to 11. Let's go. Just as the Father has loved me, this is Jesus speaking, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that what? My joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Can we do verse 11 again? These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Ladies and gentlemen, worship enjoys God to enjoy means to to experience joy it means to take pleasure in something or in someone is to have and use something with satisfaction so you can say that oh he enjoys an excellent income from his from his retirement funds you know it means to have and use something with satisfaction to have the benefit of something oh we enjoy this Medicare in Canada Worship enjoys God. In other words, when we worship God, we can experience His joy. We can take pleasure in God. We can have Him with satisfaction. We can benefit from all He is and all He does. You know, one of the most popular definitions of worship is from the book of Revelation. Worship is bringing God pleasure. And we'll talk about that in the next couple of weeks when I talk about how worship excites God. But today, I want us to look at the fact that true worship also brings us pleasure. By enjoying three D's, three things. One, by enjoying God's due, 
Number two, by enjoying God's dealings with us. And number three, by enjoying God's delights. God's due, God's dealings, God's delights. Let's take each one of these and then we'll spend a time of prayer and worship and before the communion. God's due, D-U-E. What is due? Due is something that is owed somebody. All right, so I got a bill a couple of days ago from Bell, and they said, your monthly payment is due. <laughs> All right, pay this 57 point something dollars by March 9th. It is due. You've got to pay. It is due. You owe them. You've got to pay. So a due is something that is owed somebody or it's owed something. Something owing, that's a due. Or something that is observed as a moral and natural right. So you can say that, Respect is due to our parents. We owe our parents a moral and natural. Our parents, and I owe, uh, sorry, we owe our parents a, a natural and moral obligation to respect them. All right, that is due. And I'm saying that we enjoy worship. We enjoy God. We enjoy God when we give Him His due. Right from verses one and two in Psalm 65. Don't forget that we've already established the fact that worship is about worship, right? Praise is due you. That's how the psalmist begins Psalm 65. It says, praise is due you, O God. Praise is due you. Praise is your right. Because, just because. <laughs> it's his right just because. Just because he is God. It's his right. Just because we are the sheep of his pasture. We are his people. It's his right. Psalm 100. Just because he died for us, he redeemed us. Praise is due him. We owe him due. We owe him praise big time. So worship is about declaring his worship. And the psalmist is saying, praise is due you. You are worthy. It is fitting. It's appropriate for me to worship you. So we realize right from verse 1 that God is first worthy of praise. He's worthy of praise. And amazingly, listen to this. When we give God his due... It brings us delight ourselves. Did you hear that? When we give God his due, it brings us delight ourselves. You know why? Because we were made for this. <laughs> it's like fish in water. When fish gets into water, it's like, man, I was made for this. You put a fish on the table, it goes, blah, blah, blah. it's like, man, life is hard. Blah. You know, like, what? You put a fish in water, it goes, ooh, ooh, I was made for this. I was made for water. Listen, we were made to give God his due, to give God his praise. And when we give God his due, we are like fish in water. It brings us delight because we're made for this. I remember an old 1997 integrity music song written by Ed Kerr and George Searcy. It says, we were made for this. Dwelling in your court, praises on our lips, gazing on your glory. Here we find our joy as we enter in, destined to be yours. We were made for this. We were made for this. What were we made for? Dwelling in your courts, praises on our lips, gazing on your glory. Here we find our joy as we enter in, destined to be yours. We were made for this. When you do what you are made for, it's a pure pleasure. That's why every one of you must find what God created you to do. It's not every job that is yours to do. Find what you were called to do and you realize you enjoy your work. We were made to worship God. And when we give him his due, it brings us such enjoyment. Generally in life, we are happy when we have paid our due. I'll not be very happy if Bill, if Bell comes and says, hey, two months notice, you haven't paid your bill. No, if you don't pay by the third month, we're going to report to the credit bureau. Oh, Lord, no. When we pay our due, we are happy. Listen, when you pay God his due, you will be happy. You will enjoy him. You know, giving is what makes us happy. Hoarding depresses us. Give him his praise. 
because he's due his praise. Praising God takes our eyes off ourselves and our circumstances and we savor his beauty, his awesomeness. We give God the worship that is due and we get to enjoy because we're made for this. Secondly, verse 1b, so verse 1a, he says, praise is due you, O God. Verse 1b, he says, and to you shall vows be performed. You see, secondly, God is worthy not only of praise, he's worthy of our performance. What do I mean by that? Listen, if you make a promise to God, he expects you to keep it. And it brings such satisfaction that you promised God something and you did it. So God, I give my life to you and you've taken your life back. No. We get enjoyment in God when we give him our performance, when we perform our vow. He says, what? And to you shall vows be made. Thirdly, we listen, when we bring God prayer, because he's worthy of prayer, we enjoy him. He says in verse 2, O you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come, to you shall all people come. You know, prayer enjoys God. There's a 17th century French woman called Madame Guyon. Now, very controversial, depending on what you read. But Madame Guyon once said that prayer, prayer is in essence experiencing the joy of who God is. Prayer is experiencing the joy of who God is. And then he, she continues, she says, in the beginning, you were led into his presence by prayer. But now, as prayer continues, the prayer actually becomes his presence. Wow. The spirit moves us forward, plunging us toward the ultimate end. And what is the ultimate end? It is union with God. When we give God his due praise, when we give God his due performance, when we give God his due prayer, we are deeply satisfied and overjoyed. This is how worship enjoys God. By giving God his due. Now let me talk about secondly, God's dealings. Because worship brings God's dealings with us, God's doings in our lives into focus. And when we focus on how God is dealing with us, we enjoy him. We lift him up. Verse 3, he says, When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. You know what atoning is? What is atonement? You know anybody heard the word before? What is atonement? I know we threw it out around a bit in Christendom, right? Atonement. Sorry? Buy back, that is redemption. To buy back like a slave from the slave market, that's redemption. What is atone? It says your sins have been atoned for. Okay, I'll give you a very simple way to remember it. Atonement is like at one meant. At one meant. Now you are made one with God. At one meant. <laughs> you are made atonement. You are made one with God because Jesus has covered you with his blood, because he's removed your sin, because he's repaired the relationship, he's reconciled you by substituting himself in your place. That is atonement, at one meant. And the psalmist is saying that when my iniquities prevail against me, Lord, you atone for my sins. The, the psalmist is focusing on God's dealings with him and saying, God, you are torn for my sin and I worship you. And I enjoy your presence because you are the God that covers my sin. You are the God that cleanses and repairs my relationship with you and reconciles me and makes me one with you again. When we focus on God's dealings with us, I'm telling you, we will enjoy him in worshiping him. Verse 4a, he says, Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. Blessed is the one you choose to, and bring near to dwell in your courts. Listen, if... We will enjoy God when we focus on his dealing with us that he chose us. He handpicked us. Oh, what joy. Listen, I don't know how many of you have played amateur soccer, but in amateur soccer or, or, or community soccer, you get two very good players. And they come and they are the captains. So, Captain Red, Captain Blue. And then they begin to pick all the rest of you. And Captain says, I want this one. Captain Blue says, I want this one. Captain Red says, um, I want this one. Captain Blue says, hey, what about that one? Listen, it's a very painful thing when everybody's chosen and you're the last one left. And none of the captains want to choose, choose you. <laughs> All right. But think about it. The psalmist says that I am blessed because you chose me. You chose me. God chose you. 
He chose to bring you near. He chose to bring you near. You know, in Psalm 15, we just read Psalm 15, but in verse 16 of Psalm 15, uh, sorry, John 15, he says, you did not choose me, I chose you. When you think about the fact that God, when I think about the fact that God chose me, it just makes me enjoy his presence so much. You chose me. So when you focus on God's dealings, you'll enjoy him. When you focus on his atoning, when you focus on his choosing, when you focus on his loving you, we just read, he says, these things are spoken to you, Jesus said in John 15, so that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be made full. If you focus on the fact that I've chosen you, I think about the fact that I've loved you, if you think on these things, you will worship me and you will enjoy worship me. Your joy will be made full. In Psalm 16 verse 11, when we say by his revelations, you make known to me the path of life. Remember that worship is any act, any thought, any attitude or expression of willful adoration that exalts God and enthrones him for his dealings. Lord, I worship you for atoning for me. I worship you for choosing me. I worship you for loving me. I worship you for showing me the paths of life. Listen, when you focus on God's dealings with you, it will result in such joy in your heart. You would notice how come worship enjoys God. Think about his love. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of my Father's love. Great is the measure of my Father's love. Think about His love. So think about His atoning. The psalmist says, think about his choosing. He chose you to come near. Think about his loving, Jesus said, and your joy will be full. Think about his revelations, the things he shows you. And your worship of him will be sweet. You will enjoy him. Finally, think about God's delights. Think about his delights. You see, we've discovered that the act of praise and the attitude of praise bring joy to us, not only to God, but also to us. But listen, I want to show you how the actual presence of God is enjoyable. I am telling you, the presence of God is enjoyable. God has delights <laughs> in his presence. Psalm, four, Psalm 65, we read, the, the last verse we read, verse 4b, it says, We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house. The satisfaction in God's presence. The New Living Translation of the same verse says, What joys await us inside your holy temple? I am telling you that God's presence has delights, has goodies. They are great presents in his grand presence. Verse 11b of Psalm 16, which we read, he says, In your presence, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. Listen, the, the joy you have when you, when you watch hockey, the joy you have when, when Canada wins the gold in the Olympics, the joy you have when you fall in love, the joy you have when, yeah, some people are obviously in love. Have you seen them? All right. The, 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 the joy, all these joys are nothing compared to the joy of his presence. That's why he says, there's the fullness of joy in your presence. Can you show them that picture? Last year I was in Turkey. And you know what these are? Turkish delights. I was in Turkey. I had the privilege of visiting the excavated city of Ephesus, right? You know, I got to see where Paul was arrested, you know, where there were the riots, and they said, hey, 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 Paul, and they arrested Paul, and, and the hall in which he wanted to address the people, the acoustics are still amazing up to today. Like, you stand at the bottom of the hall, and you speak, and the whole place is, like, amazing. Now, while we were rounding up the tour in Ephesus, when we're going towards the, the, the buses, I realized that a lot of people had gathered around some of the stalls. I was wondering what was going on. This was the reason. Turkish delights. I don't know whether you like Turkish delights or locums, but it, it, these are a family of confections that are based on gel of starch and sugar. 
very sweet. Personally, I don't like Turkish delights. I don't know about you. How many of you really like Turkish delights? Only three or four people. All right. I, I personally don't like them. But I, 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 I'm, I'm here to tell you that there's, there's, there's a better brand of delights. It's called the Father's Delights. <laughs> the, the Father's Delights, it doesn't matter who you are. If once you're a human being, you would love the Father's Delights. And these delights are in His presence. Listen to something King David said in Psalm 84. David said, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, my body and soul, I will shout joyfully, joyfully to the living God. Then he says in verse 4 of Psalm 84, what joy for those who can live in your house. Always singing your praises. What joy. I want to tell you something guys as I round up this message if you want to experience the joy of heaven the joy of heaven you can enter it right now in worship the joy of heaven that's what we'll be doing 24-7 for the rest of our life 10,000 years and then forevermore all we'll be doing is bless the Lord of my soul listen the joy of in his presence the delights the father's delights listen that's why peter james and john were with jesus on the mount of transfiguration they were enjoying the presence of jesus so much they said peter said you know what we don't want to go down the mountain can we build some tents can we just stay here god's presence is enjoyable folks the father has great delights to be enjoyed don't believe the lie of the devil or the world or your flesh that says god doesn't want you to be happy and enjoy life and many of us have that mindset. And Jesus Christ comes and in John chapter 10, he says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundant. I have come that you may have life and have life in all its fullness. That's the Zoe of God, the life of God in us. You see, right from the Garden of Eden, man bought into the lie of the devil that God is this selfish God, this selfish power who wants to have all his enjoyment at all costs, including at our personal enjoyment costs. Did God really say? Did God really say? And the woman says, well, God said we can enjoy everything except this. And the woman just considered on the one thing God said that she didn't touch. Paul writes to Timothy and says, Timothy instructs the rich Christians not to be haughty, to be proud, not to set their hopes on uncertainty of riches, but to set their hopes on God. Listen to this, 1 Timothy 6, 17. Set their hopes on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Man, is that in the Bible? Did you hear that? He says, God richly provides us everything to enjoy. Guys, there are pleasures in God's presence. Our problem is that we are too easily satisfied with junk food. The first time I sat in first class, business class, from Montreal to Amsterdam, I said, oh, wow. Is it the same airplane? <laughs> Even the food is different. The problem is that we are too easily satisfied with junk food. We are too easily satisfied with cheap wine. We are too easily satisfied with fake bling. Guys, I want us to read something that C.S. Uh, sorry, C.S. Lewis said. You remember C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia? Let's read this together. C.S. Lewis says, "Oh, it should be our Lord." I don't know why it said, "Oh Lord." It's our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea at Disney World or whatever it is. He says, we are far too easily pleased. Listen, the joy in God's presence from his delights cannot be compared with any other joy. Many of us here are married and I want to tell you that joy is greater than any orgasmic joy you can have. That joy is infinite. 
Let me read how the Kisman describes it. He says, imagine a joy that transcends anything we could possibly anticipate or experience in our lifetimes. Picture it as beyond the delight of falling in love or the passion of marital intimacy. Think of it as surpassing the birthing of a child, wildly succeeding in a career, loving a grandchild, or growing old in a happy marriage. Imagine all of that put together, but much, much more. Then add to it total health with a complete absence of pain, fear, doubt, and any form of discouragement. In other words, imagine a joy that is unimaginable. Imagine absolute joy. That is what we get in his presence. You see, in 1643, the English parliament called upon, quote-unquote, the learned, godly, and judicious divines, talking about the priests, to meet in Westminster Abbey in order to provide advice on issues of worship, doctrine, government, and discipline of the Church of England. These meetings lasted five years, and they produced some documents. Can you show them that? The, 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 that's right. They produced some documents, the confession of faith, as well as a larger catechism and a shorter catechism. A catechism is just, is just a summary of the principles of Christianity in the form of questions and answers, right? For more than three centuries, various churches around the world have adopted the confession and the catechisms from Westminster as their standards of doctrine subordinate to the Bible, second to the Bible. Now, the Westminster Catechism defines our ultimate raison d'etre. The Westminster Catechism says, the chief end of man, our raison d'etre, the reason for our being, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Listen, worship is both the means and the end of this purpose. In your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand, our pleasures forevermore. Ladies and gentlemen, as we come before God in the Holy Communion shortly, I want to tell you that true joy and enjoyment begins and ends with God. There is a deep emptiness deeper than the Grand Canyon, which can only be satisfied by God's infinite and immutable presence, which only worship of Him can bring. The height of our enjoyment of God is directly proportional to the depth of of our offering him his delights, his due, sorry, acknowledging his dealings and savoring his delights. God wants us to delight in him. Worship enjoys God. It provides an entry point, a place of entry to enter into the delights and the pleasures of God. I like the worship team to come up for us to sing the song as we close in prayer. And as we come before the Lord's altar, we're going to do a very short communion. I'll ask the elders to come forward. I like to think about the presence of God. And the things that the presence of God does not only, or we do not only have to experience it when we come to church. We can practice His presence 24-7 at work, on the bus. We can focus on His due, His praise that is due Him. Our performance of our promises that is due Him. Our prayers that are due him and will enjoy him. Secondly, we can focus on his dealings, his atoning, his loving, his choosing, his revelations, his showing us of things and enjoy him. And his actual presence, we can savor his delights. Shall we please be on our feet and pray? This song says, in your presence I am content. In your presence there is fullness of of joy and if you are here and you do not know jesus personally you don't understand any of the stuff i'm saying because you don't even have any clue tell the lord jesus you want to experience true joy and enjoyment and you want him to come into your life and forgive you atone for your sins can you give us a tune let's just sing one verse of it and then as we give the communion elements out we'll continue in worship do you know his presence we want to enjoy you oh god and if there's anybody here with depression pray that god you will take it away this morning in your presence let that depression go now in jesus name be gone be lifted off 
but will enjoy the pleasures of our father our father's delight let's try it it says in your presence in your presence i am content again in your presence i am content in your presence there is light expressions of your love and revelations of your power and might in your presence i can bring my love and offering i'm in the presence of my king hallelujah let's take it again in your presence oh yeah I am content oh in your presence oh I am content in your presence there is light expressions of your love and revelations of your power in your presence in your presence I can bring a lost and not for me. I'm in the presence of my King. Just thank God for his presence that he has chosen you to come near to him. Thank him that you can experience his presence. Even as we come, <laughs> blessed are those who you choose to come near. Imagine God has invited us to his table. And if you're here and you've given your life to Jesus and you have been baptized, you can come to his table. You can come to his table. You can come near and enjoy. And enjoy his bread, his body that was broken for you. And enjoy his blood that was spilled for you. He atoned for your sins. Your sins he remembers no more. Pastor Lam, can you join us? Can we read this together? First Chronicles, First Corinthians, sorry, chapter 11, verse 23 and 24. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I'd like us to pray this prayer. This is something that St. Francis of Assisi wrote. Let's say it together. We should wish for nothing else and have no other desire. We should find no pleasure or delight in anything except in our creator, redeemer, and savior. He alone is true God, perfect, good, all good, every good, and the true and supreme good, loving and gentle, kind and understanding. Pray to God that if you have made everything, anything more desirable than God, that he'll forgive you. That he'll put you back together. Even as we partake the bread together. In the same way, can we say that together? In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's come until he comes. Shall we pray this together? Nothing then must keep us back. Nothing separate us from him. Nothing come between us and him. At all times and seasons, in every country and place, every day and all day, we must keep him in our hearts where we must love, honor, adore, serve, praise and bless, glorify and acclaim, magnify and thank the most high, supreme and eternal God, three in one. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creator of all and the savior of those who believe in him, who hope in him, and who love him. Without beginning and without end, he is unchangeable, he is invisible, he is indescribable and ineffable, incomprehensible, unfathomable, blessed, and worthy of all praise, lovable, delightful, and utterly desirable beyond all else forever. I don't know about you, but Lord, I want to delight in your presence. And as your people take of your blood and your body, may it usher them into a new level of relationship with you that they really get to enjoy you and that their joy in the Lord will be infectious. In Jesus' name. 